Hello. Are you? And we'll we'll wait a couple minutes after the top of the hour because some sessions are running a little long, so we'll let people come over. Um, we expect this to be a relatively small session, so we'll do some discussion and question answering. If it's not rude, I'm going to carry on with my emails. Is that all right? That's fine. Yep. We, like I said, got another four or five minutes before we start. Hey, Ethan, how are you? Haven't seen you in a while. How's it going? Nice to see you. See you too. Sorry, trying new uh, camera configurations here. So, <laughs> and since I'm not actually speaking in this, I think maybe I'll just fade into the background a little bit, but uh, glad to be with you. Yeah, well, good to see you here. We'll, we'll have time for discussion as we move along. Excellent. I'm, I'm here as a, uh, a, a candidate for membership with UMass. So I'm here to learn all about how UMass Amherst might join in. Have you moved to Amherst now? You know, I've always been in Western Mass, so hmm. uh, not really a move. I'm, I'm still out here in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, but uh, I'll start teaching there in January. Good. Okay. Yeah, excited about it. It's a great community. Yeah, for good things. So those of you coming in, we're just letting a minute or two go by so that people can join the room. Okay, it's a couple of minutes after four. Let's see if, if when I share my screen, if I can still let people into the room.
Okay, so are people seeing the joining Pit UN PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I'm sort of multitasking here because I'm watching the waiting room and letting people in, um, but I'm gonna go, go ahead and get started. Um, so if I have any pauses, it's because I'm watching the participant list as well. So thank you for coming. Uh, I, my name is Eric Meyer. I'm the Dean of the School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also the membership and outreach committee chair for Pitt UN. I'm also the early career faculty development working group co-chair for Pitt UN. So um, one of the things to answer for you right away is do they get you involved if you get involved in Pitt UN? The answer is yes. I <laughs> think you do work. <laughs> so this, today's session, I'm just going to give maybe 10, 10, 12, 15 minutes of um, a little bit of a presentation. It's just walking you through some of the things that we are looking for at the membership side. And then I'm going to open it up to questions and, and things that might be on your mind as, as um, potential applicants at the UN. And maybe we can also uh, you know, see what institutions people are here from when we get to that phase. So um, let me dive right into a little bit about Pitt UN. Hopefully you've been attending the sessions today. So you, I don't have to define what public interest technology is or what Pitt UN is. I'm sure you've heard some of that over the course of the day. Um, Instead, I want to talk just a tiny bit about our very short history. So Pitt UN is only in its sort of third year. This is the second convening. And the list I'm showing you on the screen now are the initial charter members of Pitt UN that came in the, in the very first year. So you can see, I don't know the exact number there. It's, it's, it's somewhere in the 20 something range. I should know that, but 20 something. Um, and we were the, Charter members at last year's convening um, that started Pitt UN with New America and the Ford Foundation and everything and everybody else that's involved. Um, last year, the membership committee that I chair added a number of new members, about uh, a little over a dozen new members. So there's the full list of the network now. So the, the names that are not in bold are the newest members. And one of the things that we were looking for was really broadening the network, bringing different kinds of institutions into the network. And I spent a lot of time at last year's convening talking with potential members. Um, that's why we wanted to have this session now so that people could have their questions answered is what does it mean to join? What are we looking for when we're looking at the applications? We got about twice as many applicant institutions last year as we admitted into the network. So I'll talk a little bit about one, some of the mistakes people made in their applications. And I've talked with some of those members individually to help um, bolster their applications for the second go around. We don't have any particular quota in terms of the number of organizations we're looking for, we've got instead a, a list of priorities that we're trying to meet as a committee and as an organization. So what does Pitt UN membership mean for your institutions? Some of this information is available on the website about Pitt UN applications. And so I'm not gonna go over it in any great detail. I'm not gonna read you every word, but I wanna highlight just a couple of things about Pitt UN member benefits. Obviously, the idea of participating in people care, who care about public interest technology is the key thing. Uh, one of the uh, things available to all Pitt UN members are the grants. And you've been hearing from some of the grant applicants from your from 2019 and from 2020. And these grants, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie and say that they're gigantic grants. They're relatively modest sized grants. Some are in the 45,000 range, some 90, some 180. But they are nice ways to get things started that don't have other sources of funding. And some of them, in our experience, will lead to other kinds of funding that might be on a more significant scale. And of course, New America and the Ford Foundation are always trying to raise additional money to have a different, different kinds of grants and more, more grants available to network members. But I think it's a really nice benefit of having people who are involved in the network. Obviously, you get to join the um, network meetings, such as the annual convening that you're at right now. And then there's a number of things that we're uh, making available within the network to people who are members that are helping grow this area of public interest technology. I'll give you just two examples from the University of Texas, my own institution of grants that we got first in the first year and then in the later year. If you were in the session just before this, you would, will have heard about both of these actually. Um, the, in 1919, or 2019, we were funded for the Pitt UN Conference on Undergraduate Informatics Education. And this was held just before the university and most places went into lockdown. So it was sort of our last public physical event that we had here at the University of Texas in Austin. And it was a really great conference. It was about half of the attendees were from Pitt UN member institutions and half of the 
um, attendees weren't. They were from other institutions. And so it was a really good opportunity to get people together to start talking in this case about the pedagogy of how do you embed public interest technology in the education at the undergraduate level. And a lot of people hadn't spent a lot of time talking about these topics in a, in a conference format before. So it was a really exciting way to get people who are interested in this, these new questions of public interest technology and how do you make that real for students? How do you make that, uh, how do you teach that? What are the kinds of classes that you need to teach? Um, it, it was an exciting conference. We had, we had great attendance, we had great um, speakers and it really led to some new things including uh, collaboration that became a grant in year two. So the, one of the organization speaking at this is not a Pitt UN member institution, but it is local here in Austin, Houston Tillotson University, which is a historically black college or university. It's the oldest um, uh, university in Austin. And it's a much smaller institution than UT Austin. We have about 50,000 students at UT Austin. They have more like a thousand at Houston Tillotson, but they have excellent um, undergraduate education. They also have great connections into the community, some of which we don't have. And they gave a panel at our informatics education conference on the things that they'd done with student projects. And I attended the panel, it was really exciting. With student projects, working with community organizations to build technologies, to build solutions for these community organizations problems. So after the conference, we approached the people who presented and we proposed a new grant through Pitt UN, which is the Social Justice Informatics Faculty Fellow Program, which is a collaboration between Houston Tillotson and University of Texas in Austin. And that collaboration, we wouldn't necessarily have met each other. We wouldn't have known each other without the first small grant that then led to the second larger grant. And these could all lead to much bigger grants down the road if this all worked out. So this is an exciting partnership that is going to have 24 faculty fellows who get $5,000 uh, in summer uh, salary funding to participate in this. We're gonna have a series of seminars and then a series of um, workshops to get grants together to lead to bigger projects down the road. So I'm, I'm quite confident in saying neither of these particular things would have happened without Pitt UN because Pitt UN was really a catalyst for getting us thinking in a collaborative way around this question of public interest technology. And I'm sure you've heard many other examples throughout the course of this conference. So in the application for membership, you're asked to choose to focus on some various activities about how do you build public interest technology on your campus. And again, I'm not gonna read through all five of these. These are available on the application materials and you can find these afterwards. But getting you to think about what does it mean to support faculty and curriculum is a key issue that we've been dealing with in, in Pitt UN. How do you build pathways for students and then into jobs in the public sector or pathways for faculty building careers in public interest? This whole pathway question is something that's really been key. And for me, I think this is partly coming from Ford Foundation's long interest in public interest law that was a, was a precursor to this by many decades. And they were thinking there about how do you build pathways into people who want to work in the public sector in the legal arena. They're thinking about the same things here. How do we build pathways into engaging with the public sector and making sure that we have technology that's serving the public good. Um, there are some activities that the liaison is asked to do. So each university has a designee. I'm the designee for University of Texas at Austin. And we meet regularly, um, both at the convening, but also via conference calls. And the goal here is to both be a conduit between Pitt UN and your home institution, but also hopefully be a, a generative force at both places to be able to bring lessons that are happening on your campus, but also share back the lessons that are happening at other network campuses with what's going on at your own university. Um, everybody who's a liaison or, or a designee is assigned to various working groups. And these have been focusing on, um, uh, on various issues, including this pipeline issue that I mentioned earlier. So how is membership determined? So there's an application available. That is the link. Um, that's what you'll see when you go to that website. It's got the application details, and this is due at the end of, the, end of November, and is looking for a number of things. One of the things that we highlight is that we're really hoping that we find additional members who will continue to help us think about um, diversifying the network, and diversity means a lot of different things. Uh, so it could be 
universities that serve um, good um, pop significant populations of racial and ethnic minority students. It could be people who bring regional diversity to the network. It could be different kinds of institutions. We've got a couple of community colleges like Miami Dade, but we'd always love to see more of those. Um, different scales of, of institutions. We've had some small liberal arts members that were admitted last year. We've got big R1s like University of Texas. We really want to have different people bringing different points of view. We were really clear from the start. We didn't want this just to be a club of the same old, same old usual suspects. Um, and also how you might help uh, help us under, expand our concept of what is public interest technology and who might be involved in that. A lot of the members now are from a number of core fields. My own is a school of information. There's several schools of information who are designees at the, uh, in the network. There's a number of public policy units. There's some computer science representatives. There's some engineering representatives, law schools. And you might have something at your institution that'll help us even broaden that notion of who might be a good representative to put you in. We've got a couple of eligibility criteria, and one of the ones that is most difficult for some people to really uh, achieve is pres provost or presidential level support. Um, this is something that New America and the Ford Foundation are particularly keen on making sure happens, that it is an effort that doesn't just come from a single faculty member at an institution, but it's something that spans some force across the institution, whether it's multiple units or multiple uh, uh, levels at the institution, we want to see that you've got buy-in from a top level. And the expectation is that your provost or president will attend the convening next year if you join. Um, also, we want to see that there is some support for the designee and the team of people being put together at your campus. So again, so it's not just a solo effort. And we like to see that you've got some history of interdisciplinary education and research at your institution so that you've shown the ability to, to work well across your institution. We've got several criteria that are evaluated and these are all laid out in quite, um, quite clearly in the application form. So it's got a certain number of points for each one. The committee that looks at these has a rubric that we look at each of these six areas. Um, and I'll talk about each of them in a tiny bit of detail, but then I can answer questions about them a little bit more. So um, one is about your current or planned initiatives or strategies. We found that a lot of institutions are doing lots of exciting stuff in here. So trumpet the great stuff you're doing. Uh, this is a good place to, to show some of the things that have already happening or things that you have planned for the near future. I've already mentioned the evidence of senior leadership support. Um, the third point is showing that you've got ability to promote and communicate that you work within your, within your community and across communities. Fourth is highlighting some of the existing challenges and successes in your efforts to pursue public interest technology. One of the things I would highlight here is if you've struggled in some areas that really becoming a member of the network could help you with, highlight it here because we wanna see people who have a reason to join the network. So highlight some of the things that maybe you've tried to get off the ground, but you think would be able to be accelerated with Pit UN membership. Um, number five, we look at how it might impact your efforts. And again, this ties into if you've had challenges, how could being a member really help move these efforts forward? And then the sixth point is how will your institution enhance the makeup the, of the network? And this is what I was talking about with the diversity of students, the area of the country, the type of institution, et cetera. And you can include 10 pages of supporting documents that include things like strategic plans and, and materials that you have in place. So these are uh, uh, a list of some of the things we're prioritizing. Obviously, it's not just a numerical. If you get X number of points you're in, and if you don't, you, you are. To, we look, do a holistic review. Um, and I can tell you that in last year's round, one of the areas that some of the applicants fell down most was basically just not answering some of these. Uh, you know, they, they basically only put a sentence for something. And one area that some struggled with was being able to talk about how that institution would benefit the network. Um, they, they didn't have an answer for that. And so we asked them to go back and think about how they might benefit the network. And again, diversity can mean a lot of different things. It's not just one thing. So how can you help the, the network become more um, rich? And then some struggled getting senior leadership support. And so they, they didn't do well in that category. Um, and I think the, the areas where people probably did the best was showing excitement around some of the potential of engaging with 
pit you had in the public interest technology question. So really play those kind of things up, but don't leave any questions blank, certainly. And if you um, are struggling with how to really address something, I'm always happy to talk to people um, individually if you want to talk. I've held tons of meetings this year with institutions who either didn't make it around in around one or are thinking of applying this year. Um, I'm happy to think about how you might be able to sell yourself most effectively to the committee. So the deadline for submissions is the end of the month. Um, I do encourage you to reach out with any questions you might have. Uh, again, it's available on the website. You can, can link to the materials there. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and go back to being on camera. Um, and I'm happy to then answer any questions. And this room is a normal Zoom room so people can unmute themselves and, and uncloak themselves. Uh, it's not one of the webinars that we've been in. So um, I, I see a couple of questions already in the chat. Let me go right to those. Can you define the roles of designee and liaison? There's really no difference, they're the same thing. Um, the person who is designated to be the main contact with the institution will be um, you know, attending the meetings and uh, being part of the, the working committees. Um, Marine Roy's asked, would tribal colleges potentially qualify? Um, absolutely. There, um, she points out there's over 40 in the US awarding certificates, two years degrees and some bachelor's degrees. Uh, absolutely, they would qualify for membership. Um, as I said, we have community colleges that are offering two years degrees that are members. We would love to see that kind of richness adding to the network. Um, we don't have any size limit. Uh, you know, a small institution, small institutions are great. Some of our, our newest member institutions are very small. Um, some are some are very big. So we we unlike some organizations don't have some sort of oh you must have this much research expenditure or this many you know, none of that. We want to understand how being a member could really benefit your institution and how your institution could benefit the network more broadly. Um, and so I, I would see tribal colleges really being an excellent potential member. So those were a couple of questions in the chat um, and I'm happy to hear questions out loud. So Ethan, you have to see your hand up. Sure, um, two, and I'm, I'm sorry, these are both specific to uh, where I'm coming from. I'm, uh, writing the application right now for UMass Amherst, where I'm joining the faculty in January. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't help you very much in terms of uh, geographic diversity. You've got a good Massachusetts representation. There's two ways that I'm kind of hoping that we may be able to help. One is that as you know, the, the sort of flagship state university, we anchor um, a group of smaller liberal arts colleges that are not a member of the network. And we also serve as uh, a resource for most of the community colleges in the state. Um, how are other sort of anchor state universities dealing with that? Is that something that they're, they're bringing out and, and, and sort of talking about in it? Or is, is, that, is that something that we should bring out? I'll and reference? Definitely highlight that. Definitely, definitely highlight that. I mean, that I think is an excellent way because being a, a sort of node in another network that you build a connection to is an excellent way to show how you diversify the network just beyond UMass Amherst membership, but bridging out. Like I said, with our new grant that we're involving Houston Tillotson, they're not a Pitt UN membership member right now. Maybe they will be down the road. Um, I think that was one of the reasons this grant proposal was then attracted to the people who are reviewing it is because it expands that out. So I would definitely see highlighting those connections you've already got as a way of building it out, not just through your membership, but through your network. That's great. And, and just another really quick question on that. Um, one of the major partners that we're likely to bring into um, our application is our PhD program in nursing, mm -hmm. uh, which amazingly enough uh, is doing brilliant work on nurses as um, essentially advocates for, for both uh, patients and practitioners in dialogues about technology. Um, do you have any other nursing schools that are involved in the network at this point? I don't, I don't think we do have as members. Um, we've got some connections like here at Texas, uh, one of the faculty members in our school has a cross appointment in nursing. And so we've got some engagement with there, although nursing isn't sort of the designee unit, they are participating in that way. But absolutely, I think that's a good way to highlight it. There are people with interest in health, um, but I think highlighting bringing in a, a nursing unit to show some of that really on the ground engagement with patients and health information is really a good addition. 
that that's great. The uh, the the head of the PhD nursing program will be my co-author on the application. So yeah, I think that uh, will be it that. I'm I'm going to shut up for now. Those were my questions. This has been hugely helpful, and I'm just going to stay and listen. Good, good, good. Um, so I see a couple hands up. So I think I saw uh, Shilpa first, and then Diana after that. Sure. So, so my question is actually connected to Ethan's question, builds off of that. So we, um, I represent Cleveland State University, and we have a, a very robust partnership with Case Western Reserve University, which is a mm -hmm. private university. So it's an interesting yep. partnership. It's been um, very active for the last three plus years, and we are doing good work in this space. I'd like to think it's good work. Um, so should what is your advice for us? Should we apply separately? Should we apply together? Should one lead and have and you know bring in the other university under us? Hmm. What do we do? I mean, I, I could, so I could see a real advantage to sort of, if, if you're doing things jointly and you want to have one that need between you, I could, I could certainly see an argument for making a really strong case of how you want to, use your existing partnership to then add into this network. Um, you know, I, I think probably what I would say is, I haven't talked about this with New America, but um, my own hunch is that you could put in a joint application and, and put a note saying, you know, if you'd like us to join as two separate institutions, we're happy to do so, but we think that it'd be strong together. Um, I, I certainly would see that as a positive. And I know Cleveland State in case West. I, I'm from Ohio and my wife grew up in Cleveland. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I think you could argue about the diversity your two organizations bring to each other as being something that you also bring to the network. If are already understanding how to partner between neighboring institutions and in different serving different communities will help you bring something unique to the network as a sort of joint member of the network. Right. One just quick follow-up question. The, the application form says designees with an S. So my takeaway from that is that it is possible for us to have more than one designee, even if yeah. we went with one institution's application. Yeah, I think we could be flexible to accommodate that. Got it. Thank you. Diana? Hi, so thank you. This has been really helpful. I'm coming from American University. I'm the yeah. US Provost for Research. And Perfect. so we're trying to, we're, we're putting our application together. We're very excited about it. But I wanted to ask you a question about the types of partnerships. We have lots of partners that are global, international mm -hmm. institutions. Would that be something that would be good to highlight in this? Absolutely, case? absolutely. So one of my goals as the chair of the membership committee is to figure out a way to make us more international. Okay. Um, one of the problems I know with the network is it's still based in North America. <laughs> and so we're, one of our goals for our committee this year is to think about how do we open up membership beyond North America. One of the things that I've, I've been trying to get clarification from New American Ford Foundation is uh, specific things like grant eligibility and whether funding can flow outside the country. That's a sort of technical detail, but conceptually, I, most of my career was spent in Europe. I, I, I'm British and American and I was in the UK for most of my career. And I really wanted to broaden out fit you into becoming an international network, not just a North American or just a US at the moment network. Okay. So showing that you've already got international partners that you're gonna help bring into the network, absolutely, I'm gonna see that as a positive because that's one of our stated goals for the committee over the coming years is to really think about how we can become more internationalized. Perfect. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, I see a couple of questions over in chat. Let me pop over there for a second. So our team is housed in the VP for research department. We have full support of the provost to join. We're trying to determine which person would best serve as designee, any advice? Um, really anybody that's gonna be able to dedicate some time and energy to the network. Uh, you know, I, I think most of our designees are faculty members of various sorts. Um, I think I'm the only, Dean, Dean, so I, I'm the Dean of the School of Information. I think I'm the only Dean who's a designee. Um, we've got several who are directors of institutes or department chairs, um, other kinds of faculty positions. Um, so essentially we just want to see evidence of somebody who cares about public interest technology and is going to um, participate in this. If it was somebody that was you know, a first year assistant professor, we might worry about whether they've really got the time to designate to it. So it's probably gonna be someone a bit more senior than that. But beyond that, um, I think we're pretty flexible. Um, can a faculty member be the designee? So that sort of answers that as long as there's evidence of high level administration for this strong team. So 
Absolutely. The president and provost aren't the designee um, ever. I mean, they could be, I suppose, if they wanted to be, but they're, they, they haven't been. Um, the president and provost do have a role to play. And like we had a meeting earlier this afternoon for the presidents and provosts, and that happened last year as well. Um, I think that the, but the day-to-day -day work is going to be by someone who's on the faculty level or, or uh, some, some other kind of level at the university that really wants to engage with these questions. Um, okay, so those are the chat questions. Other, other questions from the room? Oh, I see somebody in the waiting room. Okay, what else has a question in the room? I hope you weren't waiting in the waiting room too long, Serena. I, I just noticed you waiting there. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry to be late. I had a work meeting, so I'm coming off of one Zoom into another. Okay. So I, I can always stay afterwards and answer specific questions you might have if oh, other thank people's you questions so much. get answered. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, Iria. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, question. Uh, it, it, uh, about some of the mistakes that you have seen the non-successful institutions. Um, I have seen a first draft, uh, Iria from William & Mary should have said, um, I've seen a first draft of, for an application, I think as an institution when incredibly interested um, in, in taking part. Uh, I noticed that there is quite some uh, restrictions in terms of characters for, um, for the questions to answer mm -hmm. the, the, the various questions. But you, at the same time, allow about 10 pages of supporting documentation. If, in sort of the universities that were not su successful, did you recognize, did you see any patterns? Did they, you mentioned something about some being too synthetic in answering some questions. What kind of a supporting documentation you would have wanted to see was not provided? So, so don't, don't send us tons of boilerplate because we can tell boilerplate a mile away oh, yeah. and it doesn't, doesn't help us that much. Um, you know, so it's not like a grant that's 100 pages long that you're trying to fill up with all the background. And, you know, we're, we're a committee that we, we try to get our work done pretty quickly. And if we have to read tons of material that's not helpful, that doesn't help us at all. Um, so get to the point of, you know, why PUN, why now, why your institution? And uh, we, 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 we trust you to be a good institution. You have to sort of prove all that stuff. Um, I think some of the mistakes that we saw last year were there were a couple of applications that Quite clearly, clearly, we're just coming from an individual. Um, you know, they had a little research group that cared about this stuff, but they hadn't really made much effort to show that it was going to go beyond their existing efforts or their existing research group. It's like, okay, well, that's fine, but it's not really what we were trying to prioritize. Um, so anything that shows connections across the institution uh, shows either existing or desired modes of interaction are good. I'd say the, um, yeah, we, we've tried to be a little, a lot more clear this year in defining what we mean by the network diversity uh, so that we've got this broad understanding of it because some people struggled with that and because they struggled with it, they just didn't answer it. They didn't give us any, you know, they basically said, we're a big research institution. It's like, okay, well, that's nice, but that doesn't help us understand how you might enter the network. So we've been much more, I've been having a lot more individual conversations. We put more information on the website on the broad definition we have of diversity, that it can mean lots of different things, as you've seen in some of the questions today. And it's highlighting that and that, that some of the weakest applications just weren't able to really make that case on why they were applying other than it seemed like a good thing to do. Um, and I think the, the, the other, you know, the, the other, mistake and this is not entirely everybody's fault because I'll admit until last year's convening I was a little bit fuzzy on this idea of public interest technology even though I was a designee right um, I think sort of not getting it um, now that we've had the convenings and people like yourselves have attended and we've got more information available on the website I think we've got a, we've done a better job as a network in defining what public interest technology means and so hopefully people won't run go down that path before I've just talking about something that really wasn't public interest technology you know it was either just sort of just computer science or just uh you know public policy without any sort of engagement between the different areas um so we did see a couple applications like that that weren't really thinking very broadly about this interdisciplinary nature of how we engage 
uh, technology in the public interest. And I hopefully we've done a better job about communicating what that means so we wouldn't see applications making that same mistake the second time around. Thank you very much. Other questions from anybody in the room? Can I ask my dumb question yeah. of the day? Actually, absolutely, go ahead. So on the application form, under institutional contact information, there's the, you know, there's just like asking for a name. What is the role of that person? I understand the role of designees. What's the role of the, what's the role of the? We, we just need somebody to communicate with. So I think here it was someone in our um, BPR office that handles the application materials. Got it. Um, it, it yeah, that, yeah, that's, sure. that, yeah, I think that could be anybody. Um, the it's just gotta be, yeah. just gotta be somebody that communication is gonna flow through, but there's yeah. no particular significance to that individual later on once you become a member. Thank you. And do will web links work if we have web links to interesting projects or work or curriculum that's yeah, been- Yeah, yeah, that's fine. We'll, we'll take a look at things like that, yeah. Don't give us a thousand web links, but you know. <laughs> it looks like you know your audience. <laughs> I was already creating us. <laughs> I mean, we need, we do need to read all these applications, and so. Um, so I see another question coming through. Uh, some pit you members have two projects listed in their descriptions: GWS Pit Foundry and Internship Program. Um, so, so, I mean, this isn't, don't, don't think about this as project-based, you know, that there will be projects that come out of membership in Pit UN. And so, like the two I talked about were over the course of a couple of years, but we've got a lot of other things happening project-wise. Um, so you can present lots of different things that are happening at your campus as part of the network and how you'll do that. So definitely don't think about it as a single project. You know, you're not applying for grants now, you're applying for membership, but then a grant project might flow out of that. That would be the, a specific project that says, you know, here's what we're trying to achieve in the next year. But um, think more broadly about, you know, if we become part of this network, what are the kinds of projects that might flow out of that? So you can absolutely talk about multiple things that might be coming once you become a network member uh, or, or things that you've got planned. Definitely think about the, the multiplicity of things that could flow from being part of it. Right? Um, other other questions while you've got me here. It is a Friday afternoon, late in the afternoon. <laughs> Eric, if you don't mind me asking a, a question, because I'm standing in for somebody else who actually was teaching at this time and who will be the the certainly the the designee. Uh, would you mind at all if I put you then in contact um, oh, with him? It, you don't mind. Thank you for that. Yeah, 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 no, part of my part of my job is committee chair. I, like I said, I've had a lot of those meetings this year with people. I, I spend you know, half an hour on Zoom with folks and talk talking through some of the questions if they want to. And again, that applies to any of you as well. If there's questions that come up, um, I'm more than happy to spend a little bit more time with you. Okay, so. Um, would I be willing to share the recording of the session? So it is recording, so I'm guessing it'll be put someplace. So yes, uh, I'll, I'll ask New America what they're doing with it and where it's going. You know, these things just happen without my knowledge. So yes, it is being recorded and I assume we're gonna make it available someplace. <laughs> is there any kind of a network map that says here are the universities, here's how they break down private, public, here's the specialization or here's what schools so, in these universities are an active part of the membership? So there is a list of the, the members of the, the network members. Um, there are private documents with what you're asking for, but they're not on the website. So we do have you know, spreadsheets with all the designees and the things like that, right. um, but they're not public at the moment. It's one of the things our commu the, the, commu you know, the communications committee, which I'm not on, mm -hmm. um, is working on beefing up all that material. I don't think it'll be available in the next couple of weeks, to be honest. Sure. Um, if you had any specific questions, you could always um, contract, uh, contact Andreen Soleil, who's the New America contact, and she'd be able to tell you a little bit more about some of the things that are happening if you had specific questions. Um, so that, so yet, yes, that information exists, but it's not available on the web. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's helpful only in terms of um, deciding who we might want to partner with within the network. 
yeah. and how we, we bring diversity to the net, to the existing network. So yeah, yeah, yeah I, I might follow I would, up with Adrian for that. Yep, yeah, that'd be good. Great. Okay, so if there's no other questions, I think, um, Serena, you were a couple minutes late. I can stay around and chat with you if you want, if other people want to go. Um, I, I think we'll probably wrap up the main session for now, but I'll stick around here. If anybody wants to sort of ask a private question after most of the room's cleared out, I'll, I'll stick around for a few more minutes and happy to do that. There's so, nothing private if this is still being recorded. <laughs> that's true. Um, <laughs> So anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, that was all I had to share. And if I said, like I said, if you want to get in touch with me again later, just feel free to do so. Thank you so much, Eddie. Bye-bye. This was so helpful. Thank you very much. Have a good You're welcome. I would like to stick around, if you don't mind, for just yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit. Um, if you could just tell me um, briefly how you began, because obviously I I must have missed some important information. Yeah. Yeah. So I did give a little presentation. I think this recording will be available afterwards. You can go back and, and watch the little 10, 10 or 15 yeah. minute presentation I gave at the beginning um, that talked through some of the, the key things that we're looking for in applicants. And so I won't re repeat that now, but if you have trouble finding it later, just let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll either get you the recording or, or meet with you individually. Is, is your email available? So um, yeah, my email is here. I'll, it's um, dean at ischool.utexas.edu. D-E-A-N. Yep, dean at I, the letter I, S-C-H-O-O-L-E, C-A-O-O-L. H-I-G-H-S-C-H-O-L-E. Here, here, let me get my screen up. I'll show you where it is. It's, oh, okay. It is, Thank you. Uh, it's... So you see the screen there, it's on the bottom left is my email. Oh, there it is, I see it. Um, and yeah, you're, I'd, I'd be happy to either answer your question or direct you to somebody who can. And Andrina at New America is also extremely helpful in terms of getting answers for things. Who, who's the other person? Andrine Soli, um, and I don't know her email off the top of my head, but she's listed on the New America website. How do you spell her last name? S O L E Y. Oh, okay. Um, so um, I realize this is Pit UN, but you're part of a larger organization, um, which is New America, right? Right. So, so New America is the funding body and has been organizing it. Uh, so they've got the public interest technology part of New America. It took me quite a while to get my head wrapped around this. And then Public Interest Technology University Network sort of springs out of the public interest technology efforts at New America, which has funding from Ford and Hewlett and MasterCard. Um, and so Pitt UN is a, you know, it's all universities and colleges. It's a, a, a network, but we get a lot of support from New America. So we're not within New America, but we're connected to New America through the funding and through the organization that they provide. Okay. Um, but it's, you know, we're, we don't join New America in any real way. We join the network, which is facilitated by New America. But do you know um, things about New America? I, 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 I know, I know some things about it. <laughs> I'll tell you where I'm going with that. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what, if anything, is the difference between New America and New America Chicago. Um, you'd have to ask somebody at New America more about that. I don't. I don't. Okay. Okay. I'm not affiliated with them in that kind of way. I've, I've, I've visited their offices once, and I know. I know them a bit. That's okay. But yeah. I don't know and about then that. I'm wondering if you have just a soundbite definition of public interest technology, because I've been all over all the websites everywhere. I'm reading everything I can find on this. And I can't, I, I need a more specific grasp because what I'm trying to do is figure out if my work, um, my own personal research um, can fit under this umbrella. So it's a pretty big umbrella. Um, for me, it is, a, the whole network is about building the pathways for people who want to use technology for the public good. 
Um, and so it could be in uh, pathways for technologists to get jobs in the public sector, whether it's in government or non-governmental organizations. It could be in partnerships between universities and community organizations. Um, but essentially, it's all about that intersection between the public interest and people who are working with it and engaging with technology. So, so yeah, it, it, the, the way that I best understood it was, so when I came last year to the convening, I was sort of scratching my head at why, why public interest technology. And it made the most sense to me when Darren Walker, who's the head of the Ford Foundation, talked about um, the Ford Foundation's role in establishing public interest law as a field. And that public interest law in the 1960s and 1970s and 80s was really a, a approach of saying for people who care about the law and want to do good in the world and don't necessarily want to just serve the interests of the wealthy or big corporations, how do we build pathways so that they can do that, so they can achieve that through, at the time, law schools? And so this model is very similar to that, right? How do we build better pathways for people who want to do good for the public, uh, serve the public good, to have those pathways more open to them than they are right now. So, so rather so, than saying, I can only go work at a big company and make a lot of money, how do I serve the public good with these skills? So then let me just ask a more specific question, because I've been all over that material too. Um, and it's fascinating. And so my specific question is this, I'm actually an English professor, mm -hmm. but I'm very interested in um, tackling systemic racism through algorithmic bias. And, Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and what I'm interested in doing, like I'm not a computer science person at all, but I have an idea about how having a historical perspective about our legal and cultural um, development can not necessarily attack, but speak to and perhaps provide possibilities for different perspectives on unconscious or implicit bias, which could find its way into algorithms. I mean, that's absolutely the kind of topic we care about. I think one of the things that would be good to think about is that how might you partner with others, whether they're technologists or people in the public sector or other kinds of organizations to really move that work forward in a way that um, would expand upon what you're bringing from your own discipline into an interdisciplinary collaboration. That would then be a very strong story about how your work can be moved along through collaboration. Do you have any sort of example or idea about the kind of partner that might look like? I mean, it, it could be anything. It could be, um, you know, it could be, uh, community organization that cares about algorithm bias. It could be some technologists who are writing algorithms um, and you want to partner with them to figure out how to have accountability built into those algorithms. It could be um, uh, you know, other kinds of social justice organizations that are working with how to help educate people about these technological choices that are being made on their behalf and are influencing their lives. I think yeah, there's, a, there's a couple of a lot of different models there. And maybe if you could have a couple of different partners that would bring different perspectives on that, that to me would be really interesting. Okay, perfect. That is so helpful. I have been weeks trying to get precisely that engagement. So thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Can I ask, a, can I ask a stupid question? There are no stupid um, questions, but you can ask. <laughs> oh, you know that's wrong. <laughs> um, why is the, the limit to a thousand characters with no spaces? So, so that is sort of out of my job description. I have no idea. Um, it's I, can, really, I, can I can check with New America. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard I to I, introduce. I certainly didn't dictate that. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to introduce an idea, right, without being able to define anything. <laughs> so it's yeah, just- I, I didn't realize that they had that built into their form. Um, yeah. I'll check with Andreen about, let me just note that down. I mean, normally I like a good challenge like that, but um, at least create space where you can let your hair down in one of the answers and define Wait, Which term. one in particular was if it was limited to a thousand? Uh, most of them. All of them? Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll check with Andreen. I, I don't know who made that decision or why, but- I mean, I'll I get check. that you want something concise, but it's just not enough. To really... This could be this could be an example of 
um, technologists making choices without really consulting with people who have to live with them. I it guess, yeah. It wasn't a choice made by our committee, but I'll put it that way. <laughs> Somebody okay. somewhere implemented that when they built the form. Yeah, okay. And I asked a question about, um, from a project perspective, because when looking at the sample grants, it looked like they were submitting project ideas by the way that they're described. With the, with the grants, yeah. I think. So the grants are project-based, but the membership is organization. But, but like the new members, it looked like they were being described like projects. Um, okay. yeah, mean, well, that, that might just be a mistaken presentation. Okay. Um, so okay. a lot of the new members got grants that are projects. Yeah. But the members themselves are, you know, the, the applications that came in, it's based on the organization. That's multiple things that will flow out of that. It's definitely not project-based at this stage. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. And can I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, three other universities in our region are members. Mm -hmm. Should we try how much space should we dedicate to trying to distinguish ourselves and to make the argument as to why we also what, what what's your institution um american university okay um so i think one of the things that we just had some meetings about yesterday was how to build on regional cooperation in vitun yeah so it might actually make sense to reach out to some of the existing members and talk to the designees there about how you might be able to ex build on that synergy Okay, because right. we, we do have partnerships with all of them already in multiple disciplines. So I, I think that would be one way of talking about ways of strengthening strengthening the region by building on those partnerships. I see. Um, okay. Okay. That, that to me would be a, a good story to tell. Okay, great. Great. That's a, that's a good story. That I can do in 1,000 characters with no okay, space. Good. <laughs> so listening to you, I'm getting the impression that um, that I have a lot of groundwork to do with my institution before we can try to bring an application. Mm -hmm. So I need to, so basically I would need to talk to my institution and say, hey, look, look at this. Now, what can we do to build toward this application? Would you say that's probably true? From, from what I'm hearing, probably, um, and we'll, we'll have application rounds each year. So, you know, if it doesn't happen, you know, if things need to be developed still, you can come in next year. And then uh, during the year, is there any like liaison or something with um, all of you who can help with that, with the development of- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, also, I'm still chair of the committee for another year. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm happy to work with people. Um, uh, we will be continuing to have public events and you're more than welcome to attend those and talk to people and get some ideas that way. Um, as I said, the people at New America are happy to work with potential applicants. Um, so yeah, we're happy to continue to help develop ideas over the coming year. No problem. And, and just one more question. Should I, um, should, should I just maintain the link with you or should I approach New America to say, I want to find out more about what you're doing here in the region because I'm in Chicago. I think you know, definitely get in touch with New America so that you get on their mailing lists and that they're aware of your interest. I know that when, so I met with New America earlier this summer, I think it was, and they shared with me all the people who got been in touch with them about potential membership. So I was aware of some of the places that were developing applications. Um, so yeah, so I think it's good to get in touch with them and make sure that, that, that they're aware of your interest and can help you think through those things. Do you have a name at New America or not? So it's Andrine Soli. Oh, it's Wong. that person, okay. Yeah, Andrine. All she's, right. She's the main network coordinator and contact for these sorts of things, and she's tremendously helpful. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, okay. thank you. Absolutely. Very quickly, Erica, uh, you know, I'm just listening here and apologies that I can have my camera off, it's just that I was in another meeting, I couldn't get here sooner. But anyway, uh, I'm listening to the conversation thus far, it appears that it is a university, not a school level. So it's at, at the university level, so it's cross departmental and it does need to have that sort of okay. provost or president uh, okay. support. Um, so we do like to see things that, um, even if it's coming primarily from a unit, that you show at least the desire to embed other units in that, maybe have some initial support from, from these other units. Okay. Um, 
I think I, I mentioned earlier that one of the weaknesses were some applications that came in that just seemed like a person with a topic that wasn't really connected to anything else. And if it was a, simply about a grant funding, that would be appropriate. But because it's about the network, you want to see sort of sustainability there. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Very good. So if there's no other questions, um, we're coming up on the hour and I will let the last couple of you go. Have a nice weekend. Thank nice you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.